Hey guys, Dr. Court here. I hope you're having a great time so far on Spiritual Emphasis Week. Uh, I want to talk to you about three of the fruits of the Spirit. Before we do, let's just go over them from Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's pretty awesome that what one of the things we're learning, one of the things I hope you guys take away from this is an understanding of what God meant by these nine things. Love, for example, you know, we have a great example of God's definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And then sometimes what the world, uh, people who don't believe in God or, or people who don't consider God, maybe they believe in God, but they don't consider God when they think of these things. It becomes it the the word the fruit means something very different. So what love means to God, how that's described as very unselfish, very giving, very noble, uh, very beneficial to others, uh, very selfless. God's love in First Corinthians thirteen is not the way a lot of people in the world define love. For them, love is more about emotions and feelings and feeling good, and you know it's more about them. And, and what can they get out of it? And so we want to be able to draw those distinctions this week. And you guys are working on that as you get your presentations ready. Remember, those presentations can be video, it can be a short skit, or it can just be a spoken presentation where you let us know based on what fruits you were assigned. Hey, here's the difference between what God meant in the Bible by goodness, for example, and how the world sometimes defines that. So I'm excited to see those uh, on Friday during chapel. But let's break, let's blaze right in. You know, we think of faithfulness. We think of marriage. Uh, that might be the first thought that comes to mind. You know, uh, one man for one woman, and they make a covenant before God and before people. You know, I've done a lot of weddings as a pastor, and they put the wedding rings on, and that represents a promise that they are going to be faithful to each other. And the man isn't going to go with any other women and the wife isn't going to go with any other men. And for a lifetime, they're going to be faithful to each other. And a lot of devastation happens for them, for if, for their children, if there are children, for the people who care about them, sometimes for the church. Um, man, the, the devastation when, when someone is unfaithful, when they break those marital vows, and they do go with someone, they step out of the marriage and they have a relationship with somebody that they're not married to while they're married. Um, the devastation is very painful. It's very hard uh, for the people that go through, not just the, the married couple, but uh, all the people that love them and care about them. And, you know, it, 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 when it's Christians and it does happen with Christians, sadly, uh, unfortunately, all too often. Um, it, it's almost even harder because there's that element of faith there that we believe in covenant. We believe that just as God keeps his promises to us, we're supposed to keep our promises to each other. So we think about marriage, but the, the plus side of that is, man, when they are faithful, the marriage grows and it thrives and it becomes a beautiful thing. And, you know, God's design, guys, for society, the marriage between a man and a woman, it's the fundamental building block of society. He meant for husbands to love their wives. He meant for wives to love and respect and be support for their husbands. And the husband is supposed to provide for and protect his wife. And the wife is supposed to be his helper. And they're supposed to love each other through good times, through hard times. And, and as they stay faithful, the love continues to grow. And, and children grow up in the security of that love. And in that love, they're supposed to see an example of who God is. Um, and, and really, guys, not to take responsibility off the ladies, they have a responsibility to be faithful, of course. But guys, we have a tremendous responsibility to lead in this, to be faithful uh, to the woman that we marry so that we model faithfulness, so that we model what it means to keep covenant uh, to our children so that our sons and daughters grow up understanding from the example we set what covenant is and ultimately come away with that come away from that with a great understanding that God is faithful and he always keeps his covenant. And we've got a great scripture on that in just a second. But men, this this comes into play in other areas besides marriage, uh, parent-child relationships. Uh, parents who break their promises to their children and children who break their promises to their parents. You know, we say 
that we'll do certain things and we don't do them. Uh, for kids, it might be, hey, I'm going to you know, be more obedient. I'm going to do better about my chores. I'm going to do my homework better, whatever it might be. And then you don't do that. You don't deliver on what you said you'd do. That's a, a measure of unfaithfulness. And, and that disrupts the relationship between parent and child. Wherever there's unfaithfulness, there's going to be problems and there's going to be pain and regret and failure and all this kind of thing. It's true at school. Um, man, you, Dr. Court, I'm going to get you those journals. I'm going to get you those Bible journals I said I'd do. The journals don't come in. The journals don't come in. Um, you know, I'm not going to stick it to you guys. I'm still going to love you and pray for you and, and be your friend and, and be your, you know, spiritual director and all those things. But you know, there, there's a level of disappointment there when, when teachers give you an assignment and the, the understanding, the agreement, the covenant, if you will, is, hey, I'm going to be the teacher. You're going to be the student. You don't deliver. Uh, there's a level of, of disappointment when you don't because that's a, a breaking of faithfulness too. We, we weren't faithful to what we said we'd do, what we promised to do, what we signed on to do as a student. Same thing is true in career. Uh, I'm going to be on time. I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to fulfill the responsibilities that I knew were mine when I took the job. And you don't do that. And it just, it just doesn't go well. And a lot of times, you know, people get asked to resign or they get fired or whatever. Because they didn't do a good job. They weren't faithful to what they promised they would do when they took the job. And so, but you know, and the other side, bosses can be unfaithful. Parents can be unfaithful. Teachers can be unfaithful. So the fence can swing both ways. But no matter who's being unfaithful, whether it's one or both in any kind of a relationship, there's destruction and fallout. Um, you know, when there's faithfulness, it elevates everything. In, in marriage, it makes the marriage stronger. Uh, and it's better for the kids. And in parent-child relationship, you know, children and their parents stay closer when promises are kept and covenant is kept. Uh, in school, teachers and students can have, we, we do have that here. We have awesome relationships between teachers and students. Um, and, and a lot of that is because students are working really hard to be good students. That's a lot of you guys. Uh, I'd like to say that's most of you guys. And so here, you know, sometimes we have some stress and tension between students. That's true at every school. But, man, it goes really well when students and, and teachers keep our promises to each other. And then certainly in careers, man, and we're about to look at a scripture on that in just a second. Here it is. In marriage, in parent-child, in friendships, you got to be faithful in your friendships, too. Uh, in, in parent-teacher or student-teacher relationships, in employee-boss relationships, this scripture is always true. Whoever is faithful in small things uh, will also be faithful in large things. And the Bible teaches us that God will give us charge over more. He will give us more favor. He will give us more privilege. He will give us more to do. He will trust us with more if we'll be faithful in small things. And the downside of that is if we're not faithful in small things, if we're not faithful in marriage, the marriage gets in trouble. If we're not faithful in parent-child relationships, then that becomes stressful. And there's tension between parents and their children. If we're not faithful at school, then it hurts our grades. It hurts our performance. It hurts our future because we weren't faithful students. Uh, if we're not faithful at work, then we don't get those promotions and those new opportunities. And certainly as Christians, you know, we're saved when we repent of our sins and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. But there's some there's some lackluster Christianity out there. There's some Christians out there that are taking God's grace for granted. And, you know, they're happy about the fact that they're saved, but they're, they're areas of their lives. There might be areas of your life where you're not being faithful. And, and that just diminishes your spirit. And it makes the life God intended for you to have less than what it could be. But when we stay faithful, we realize the purpose for which God created us, and we're able to fulfill that purpose uh, to, to the best possible measure. And so just, just keep that in mind, guys. Faithfulness, keeping our promises, keeping our covenants is so vitally important. And the greatest thing to know, and I hope this will be a, a source of hope and strength to you guys all your lives, is Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. God's mercies are new every morning. He's never going to give up on you. He's never going to quit on you. He's never going to stop loving you. He gets frustrated with us. He has to discipline us like any good parent would, but he's never going to stop loving us. I, I used to listen to Michael W. Smith a lot, the Christian music artist, and 
you know, he sings this great song called Never Been Unloved. I've been unfaithful. I've been unworthy. Uh, I've been unqualified. Uh, I've been undesirable. All these things I haven't been, all these ways I've failed, all these ways I haven't been faithful, all these ways I haven't kept my covenant, haven't kept my promises. And God had every right to, to reject me and give up on me, but he never did. He says, because of you and all that you will do, I know that I've never been unloved. I've been all these un things, all these things I didn't do right, but I've never been unloved because God's never going to give up. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Guys, remember that. If you've messed up, no matter how far you've gone, you haven't gone far enough to escape the love of God. He will always be faithful even when we are not. And what that does for me, I can't speak for anybody else. What that does for me is that doesn't make me want to take his faithfulness for granted and say, oh, well, God's going to love me no matter what. I'll just live however I want. It makes me say, I want to live faithful to God. I want to be the best Christian I can be. I want to be the best person I can be. Um, and we're going to talk about goodness in a minute and what that really means. And I want to be that because God is faithful. I want to, I want to honor his faithfulness. I want to be worthy of his faithfulness. And I want God to know that he can trust me. When I make a promise, he can take me at my word. And, you know, your future spouse should know that. Your parents should know that. We as your teachers should know that. The people who employ you should know that. That's a, a person of integrity. That's a person who I can trust. When they give me their word, that's a faithful person. That's who we want to be. All right, goodness. What is good? So don't misunderstand this one. It, it, it's easy to get sidetracked on this one. Uh, there are good students, students who make really good grades and, and score high on tests and all those things. Uh, there are good teachers, teachers who are just very effective in the classroom uh, at getting points across and, and educating students in various subjects. Uh, there are good athletes. You know, you would be definitively right uh, when you got up and said that, um, oh, I'm trying to think, who's the GOAT? Tom Brady. <laughs> you got up and said, Tom Brady is a good quarterback. You, yeah, yeah, he absolutely is. Maybe the best of all time. Michael Jordan is a good basketball player. You guys know what I'm saying. Um, man, who's the, who's the best actor? Who do they say is the best? Tom Hanks is way up there guy named Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, you guys might like some of these Marvel actors. Uh, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Scarlett Johansson, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is a good Iron Man. You could definitively say that. All right, there's so many things you could say. They're a good employee. They show up to work on time. They're responsible. They get the job done. They do really well. And we could go on and on and on and on. That's not the kind of good we're talking about. That's, that, is, um, that is objective good statements because somebody's good at something, okay? No, we're talking about moral goodness, okay? Moral goodness. I used to watch a cartoon, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, called The Animaniacs, okay? And they would do this thing on The Animaniac, Wacko, Yakko, and Dot. Those were the three main characters. And they would do this thing on Animaniacs called Wheel of Morality, okay? And I, and I share that with you just to say Goodness defined morally is what we're dealing with here. And as I teach, if you haven't taken my apologetics course, I look forward to teaching that to you guys every year. There are four mountains in apologetics, intelligent design, which is creation, uh, the person and work of Christ, which is the, the incredible impact Jesus had on the world, the fact that he is a real person in history, everything he said he did and he did, the Bible and how miraculously that's put together and how the Bible itself validates everything we believe as Christians. But the, maybe the hardest one to nail down is, is what I call intrinsic morality. And intrinsic means that morals, a sense of good and evil, a sense of right and wrong is woven inside of us. And I believe that was put there by God. And there isn't, outside of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, there's no real there's no world belief or religion that kind of deals with that. Hinduism doesn't deal with it. New age thinking doesn't deal with it. Buddhism doesn't really deal with it. Major real living, major living world religions don't deal with the origin of morality. They talk about morality. Uh, a lot of, I'd say most of Hindu morality is right in line with biblical Christian morality. But the origin of morality, you know, we've got an, it, with Christianity, we've got an origin uh, for how everything started. It tells us why we're intelligent, tells us why we're moral. 
Okay. And, and the, the answer to that's not really complicated. We're going to get to it. But goodness in moral terms would be defined as doing things that are good in light of what God says is good. So that's what we kind of want to understand. And it's interesting in Romans 3.10, Scripture says none of us are good. None of us are righteous, not any of us. We'll say, well, Dr. Court, does that mean we, we never do good things? No, that's not what it means. You guys all do good things sometimes. But what it means is we are none of us good all the time. There's none of us who has who is perfect. There's none of us who hasn't sinned or made mistakes at some point in our life. Now, this is, as we talk through this, kind of pay attention because this is a, a good example. This, this uh, fruit of the spirit of goodness is a good example of how the world kind of takes it in one direction, but Christianity has taken it a different direction. The world's moral take on goodness sometimes is that, hey, if it feels good, do it. And another way to put that would be, if it feels good, it must be good. If it feels good, it is good. And I would <laughs> I would strongly challenge that. I think a lot of you guys would too, because some people think, you know, if, if it feels good, then it is good. It feels good, you know, in this age of social media and people can be, you know, anonymous behind their computer screen and say what they want to say without any kind of consequences or repercussion. Uh, it feels good sometimes for people to bully other people or to cancel other people or to insult them. And they do that and they get this like adrenaline or dopamine hit by interacting with people and just being hateful and ugly. But it feels good. And that's why they're doing it a lot of times. And sometimes we do that at school. Sometimes at school we bully others or we make fun of others or we're mean to others. And, and at some level that makes us laugh and we think it's funny and we think it's good. But is it good? Is it morally good? And is it morally right for us to act that way? Are there consequences for those kind of things? If it's really good, if it's genuinely good, good the way God defines good, is never going to have negative consequences. But if it's worldly good, you know, we think it's good because it makes us feel good, and it does have neg negative consequences, you got to really ask yourself practically, well, was that really good then? Because it had it brought about destruction and it brought about hurt and failure. So yeah, insults, uh, some, some people fight, you know, they fight because it feels good. They like the adrenaline rush of it. You could do a whole thing on adrenaline. You know, a lot of adrenaline junkies do crazy things uh, to get that spike of adrenaline that feels good. And they would say, hey, it is good. It's good because it makes me feel good. And they end up dead. Or severely injured because of whatever crazy stunt they they needed to do uh, to feel good. Um, sex is part of this. You know, people have sex because it feels good. But the Bible teaches us that it's only right inside of a covenant marriage relationship. It's only right when there's a commitment because it sex was not designed for two people to come together that way and then split apart. It brings about all kinds of emotional pain and regret. And, um, you know, people get depressed once they're together and then they can't be together or somebody breaks up with somebody or quits on somebody or whatever. There's no covenant there. there there's nothing more meaningful than just the act itself. And, and sure, while it was lasting, it felt good, but it can bring devastating consequences afterward when there's no covenant, when there's no commitment. God didn't design it that way. Any kind of addiction, you know, drugs, alcohol, substance abuse, all these things. Why do people do those things when they are physically, you know, literally, we know large consumption of alcohol uh, destroys brain cells. It destroys your liver over a period of time. We know that consistent smoking of cigarette destroys your lungs. People do it anyway because it relieves stress in some ways or it feels good. And if, and if it were true, though, guys, that if it feels good, it is good. If it feels good, you should do it because it is good. If that were true, then there wouldn't be any damage from doing anything that feels good. Think about that. Everything that's true is supported by evidence. And I would make the case, I would make the argument that everything that's truly good, as God defines good, does not have negative consequences. It does not have damaging consequences. But as the world defines what's good, you know, if it feels good, it is good. 
And yet some of the things we do that feel good bring destructive consequences for ourselves, for other people, for the people who love us. I think you can make a definitive case. Well, then that's not good then. How can it really be good if it brings about destruction? So I've, I've kind of written, this just kind of came off of my head as I was reading through this. And this is, I do believe this is biblical. It's also very practical though. Goodness is found in thoughts that lead to actions. Now understand guys, we don't act without thinking. Everything you do, every action you execute first was in your mind. It was in your head before you did it. Okay. So goodness is in thoughts starts with the thoughts that lead to actions that are in the best interest of the individual. It's in the best interest of yourself and the collective in the best interest of everybody else. Okay. This is a picture, a picture of a, of a teenage girl on a mission trip uh, in a foreign country. And she's loving on a child there. And, and she thought in her head, I'm going to go to this foreign land and I'm going to provide food and I'm going to provide clothing and I'm going to share Bible stories. and I'm going to play with these children and read stories to them and love them. Man, I, I've been to Cuba and Guyana and the island of Dominica, places where there is some abject poverty and so many children and not enough adults, not enough adults to love them. And, and the chance we had for a week or two weeks when we were on mission just to hold these children and love them and make bracelets with them and read them Bible stories and play with them and push them on the swing. I, we went to, uh, when I was teaching at DCA, every year we would do a mission trip to the uh, Dominican Republic. And I ate so many bananas. We, all we had in our dorm area was bananas at the mission where we were staying. And I just ate so many bananas, my team started calling me Coco, Coco the monkey. And that caught on with the children we'd go work with every day. And, and I, you know, I'd push the children on the swing and then we'd go higher and higher. And we had a great time. Anyway, like two or three days in, I'd show up, Coco, Coco, come, Coco, come. Right. They're mostly Spanish speaking. Um, and, I, you know, I didn't speak their language, but I understood what they wanted. Right. They wanted Coco to come love on them and push them on that swing. And just something as simple as that gave me a sense of fulfillment, a sense of purpose, a sense of worth uh, that's beyond any feel-good thing I could do. Like, I don't know, um, you know, we play video games for hours on end because it feels good or all these things we've talked about. Um, things that benefit others. Things that require sacrifice on my part. Uh, they're really good because they always result in me feeling like my life had purpose and in others being helped. Okay. And guys, that's why we're, that's why we're doing service projects this week. That's why we're going to do a mission trip in, uh, in March with our grades 11 and 12. That's why we go. That's why we serve. That's why we help. You know, when, when you're at school and you have an opportunity to bully and that, that might get your friends to laugh. And when they laugh, that might feel good. But instead you say, hey, I'm going to think thoughts that lead to actions that lead to the best interest of myself and of other people. Nobody gets bullied because what you chose to do was be kind to the individual instead of insulting to them. Now you feel better about yourself and they weren't hurt. There wasn't any consequences in any way. I hope that makes sense, guys, because goodness, as it flows from the heart of God, is always in our best interest, and it never brings with it negative consequences. So we want to understand goodness in that light. It's unsel Goodness is unselfish. It's selfless. It, it, you know, Jesus is the best example. If you say any person that lived on this earth was good, it'd be him. It'd be Jesus Christ, right? Um, and it's, and he was, everything he did was beneficial to others and, and for us eternally, what he did is still benefiting us today. We can still be saved and have eternal life with God in heaven because of what Jesus did. And it was hard for him. And, and goodness is that goodness is not always doing the comfortable thing or the easy thing. Sometimes it's doing the hard thing, uh, for others, but you're always going to reap the benefit of that too. You're going to know 
that you're right where God wanted you to be. I think about Paul and Silas too. Uh, they were sharing the gospel and they were chained up and in prison for it. They were beaten and then they were chained up under a latrine. They were chained up under the place where people use the bathroom. And they were down there singing hymns and singing songs that they were happy. We're going to talk about that when we talk about joy because they knew that what they did was good. I love this. Um, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Some of you guys may be too. I don't know. I love this quote from the wizard Gandalf. He's talking about, you know, there's this, there's this evil that's encroaching upon the land. It's ultimately, you know, it's, it's in that ring. It's called the Lord of the Rings and it's in the ring of power. And there are, you know, forces for good that think that the way that we stop the evil is through strong might and power and a, and a mighty military force and a mighty sword. And Gandalf says, I don't think that's it. He said, some believe it's only great power that can hold evil in check. And that is not what I find. I have found that it is in small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness, you might even say small acts of goodness and love, things that are sacrificial, things that are noble, things that are beneficial to others and not just beneficial, just beneficial to us. And here's the thing. Here, here's the beauty of God's goodness. When we are selfless and kind and good to others, it's going to be good for us and there's no fallout from it. So um, I know that's a lot, but I really wanted to unpack that one. That one's so important. And we draw the distinction. Well, here's what the world says is good. And here's what God says is good. And then the last one real quickly is just joy. And I just want to draw a quick distinction that people sometimes get confused on. There's joy and there's happiness and there's a difference. And a lot of people don't always think about that, but I, I wanted to flesh that out with this chart here real quick. Joy is a state or condition. Okay. Joy is a condition of my heart. It's a condition of my mind. Okay. It's not something that is necessarily subject to change, but it's something that is stable. It's a state or a condition that I'm in. Whereas happiness is an emotion. And we all know how emotions go. Emotions are like this. You guys come to school. I watch you guys at the door. You come to school someday with a smile on your face. You're rip roaring, ready to go. And you come to school someday. You do not want to be here. Okay. But that's not always the same. You have good days and you have bad days. Sometimes you're happy and sometimes you're not happy. But joy is a state or a condition of, of knowing that something is true that's not going to change. And we'll, we'll elaborate on that in just a minute. So joy is constant. Okay? It doesn't change. It doesn't go away. It doesn't fluctuate based on our circumstances. Happiness is temporary because it does fluctuate based on our circumstances. Uh, man, if we have a great day and people are giving us compliments and we had, we did great at the ball game or we did great in our performance in the arts or, uh, you know, we, we made a really good grade on a test or whatever it may be, uh, we emerge from that being very happy. Man, it was a good day. But then we have days where, you know, we, we got a bad grade and we didn't perform well in the arts or the athletics and people were not kind to us and, the things we hoped for didn't come to pass and then we're down and you know life stinks and all that kind of thing that's that's kind of how it is we're not always happy because our circumstances are not always pleasing to us joy is internal um, joy is something that we have inside so referring back to paul and silas they had joy that came from knowing they were inside the will of god so even though they were in physical pain and even though they were dirty and smelly and even though they were chained up in a prison, they had joy because they knew they were suffering for God and they knew they were where he wanted them to be. Man, I have been on mission trips where we were hot, where we had to miss meals, where we weren't sure when we were going to get back to the place where we were staying. Um, all kinds of circumstances that were a little bit scary sometimes, very difficult sometimes. But I can honestly say to you, that even though there were times that were painful or uncomfortable physically, um, there was never a time ever on a mission trip where I wanted to be anywhere else. I knew, and I kind of feel like that here teaching at LCA. I know that I, when I'm in a place doing what God's called me to do, I have joy. And that's never going to be taken from me. Uh, I, my happiness in that place may fluctuate, okay? 
I may get frustrated. Things may not go the way I want, but my joy doesn't fluctuate because I am where God wants me doing what God's called me to do. And guys, as long as you do that, you're going to have joy, unchanging, unaltering joy, regardless of your personal comfort or your circumstances. And happiness is more external. Like I said, Man, being a pastor, you can see it on people's face from the pulpit. There's happy people. You can see in their face it's external, and there's people not so happy. And a lot of times people can't hide it. They can't fake it. Joy comes from God. And this says happiness comes from the environment. I would probably phrase that differently. I'd say happiness comes from circumstances. Circumstances are favorable. We're happy. Cir- circumstances are not favorable, not going good the way we want. We're not happy but joys from God. And since we know, this last one, since we know that God is always faithful, since we know that God is always good, then we can have strength in our knowledge of the Lord because we know that he'll never fail us. That's why Nehemiah 8.10, the prophet Nehemiah was right. The joy of the Lord is my strength. His mercies are new every morning. And his faithfulness is great. He never fails us. And I pray, guys, that your joy will always come from the Lord and and from no other place. Happiness will come and go. That's human. That's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. We're all that way. But in the worst possible circumstances, when times are tough, dig in and find that joy of knowing because Jesus is, everything's going to be okay. I love you guys. I hope you continue to have a great week and be blessed. See ya.